Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with Chicago-based jazz saxophonist and composer Chris Madsen. He opened up about his new 2023 Trio CD out on May 12, 2023, and he did this with longtime collaborators bassist Clark Summers and drummer Dana Hall. He is one of the most in-demand figures in the Chicago jazz world as a performer, composer, and an educator. He is a much sought after jazz clinician and he's all over the place at jazz festivals and workshops, teaching all ages and levels from across the globe. He's got a great story. Enjoy this interview. I'm doing good. I'm good. Thank you so much for agreeing to do this. Yeah, my pleasure. And, uh, you know, before we get into your CD that's going to come out on May 12th, I'm mm-hmm. curious, you know, the, the COVID time, the three years really kind of threw everybody into a different space and, and turned everything upside down. I'm wondering how you survived that time period and how it subsequently has changed the way that you live your life now that we're coming out and things are opening up. Oh, wow. That's, yeah, that's a very interesting question. Um, well, I, I survived it by sort of, um, I was just thinking about that earlier today, but sort of scrounging for whatever live stream gigs were available during that time. Um, you know, it was... Uh, it, it, it was a tough time to be a professional musician that goes without saying just because they're, they're just the performing opportunities just completely dried up, you know? Um, but there were, especially up here, at least in Chicago, um, there were some clubs that were doing, you know, live streaming events and, and sort of trying to keep, keep the patrons interested. And so I was, I was involved in some of that stuff. And then the other side of my involvement, um, during COVID was sort of, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of increased my social media presence, my Instagram, what have you. I, I made a couple of different little series of, uh, of videos that I just produced myself on the, on the cheap, you know, and um, with some transcriptions and um, things like that, uh, that, that I kept going uh, during the lockdown. And then um, in terms of how it's, shaped me now i mean really it's just sort of i I think i'm just more um appreciative uh you know i I try not to take um performance opportunities for granted uh in a way that i may have done before just because you know who knows when that would happen again um and it uh yeah it really sort of deepened my appreciation for the fact that we're able to do what we do for a living and perform publicly for people that are willing to give us a chance and, and be heard. And I, I know that that's reflected in a lot of the gigs that I play um, when we're doing audience uh, banter, when we're on the microphone and things. Uh, everyone, it, all the musicians sort of all, they all have this sense of, of thankfulness, <clears throat> you know, that, that we're back and, and uh, we're sort of out of the, the darkness, knock on wood, of that whole thing. So, yeah, I think that's that's probably the, the way that it's shaped me the most uh, in terms of, uh, you know, in a post-COVID world. So the release of the trio book has to feel good, you know, relatively new year, um, live shows are coming back, just having a project out. So how, how A, yeah. how does this project feel, and B, what went into this? What, what, what artistically went into getting this project complete? Yeah, it definitely feels great. I mean, it especially feels great because it's been uh, about, it will have been about three and a half years since my last release. Um, and part of that was due to the lockdown and the fact that um, there just wasn't, I mean, there were people releasing albums and everything, but I just, I didn't want to put something together during the lockdown. I wanted to wait till after it was done. Having said that, we did record it about two years ago. Um, but as far as the release and, and promotion of it and everything, I, I, I definitely wanted to wait till sort of we were out of the woods. Um, and then, yeah, so what went into the recording was, was um, it's uh, two-thirds of the rhythm section that was on my previous album, which was called Bonfire, that was released in 2019. So we just, um, I just got my bassist and, and the drummer together, and um, I put some tunes together that were... Uh, to my knowledge, have never been recorded in that format before. Um, there are some more obscure tunes uh, that you wouldn't find on a um, on a uh, people doing covers of very often. And uh, I have one original on there that I wrote specifically for that group. Um, but other than that, they're all covers of tunes that uh, that I 
to feel really strongly about tunes that really resonate with me personally and tunes that I thought um, could be successful in that chordless trio format. And, uh, you know, there's a real rapport that I have uh, at this point, I think, with Clark and Dana. We just, we've been playing together for, for a really long time, and, and uh, they specifically have been playing together for much longer than that, um, you know, since the 90s. And uh, so it goes without saying that they're, <clears throat> they have a stellar hookup, um, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to sort of join them in that, in that musical space. You know, it's interesting. I caught Miguel Zanon in Kansas City probably about three weeks ago, and he was with his trio, and he's been with those cats for a long, long time. And it was right. intense. And he had yeah. mentioned how, how, how much they played off of each other. So my question to you is being comfortable and playing with these guys for a while. How do you guys interact when you play live? Do you push each other continually? Do you get to a place where you're comfortable, you're just doing the music? How does that work with the communication and the vibe between you guys? Oh yeah, definitely. It's 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 certainly. Um, I mean, one thing I will say about these guys um, that is really true of all the best world class jazz musicians, um, in my estimation, is their the openness of their of their concept and their and their ears. It's just they they hear everything that that I am trying to do. They they're to a level that they're basically anticipating it before I even do it. They're they're a couple of mind readers. And, um, you know, it really, it really makes such a difference. Um, maybe that goes without saying too, but it makes such a difference when I'm, I, I feel like I can just kind of do anything with these guys, uh, and they will respond accordingly to it and be really supportive. And they, they have a genuine interest in every, everything that I'm saying. So it's really a conversational, um, a conversational kind of an approach, um, that I really, really value with these guys specifically. So how did this jazz journey begin for you? How did you get interested? Well, who were some influences and kind of the seeds? How did they get planted into becoming who you are today? Oh, sure. Well, I went to a, a public uh, high school. Um, I, I started playing saxophone before high school, just sort of in the school band program. But I was very fortunate to grow up in an area with a strong uh, music program in the, in the suburbs of Chicago. And um, I was sort of on the path. Uh, I, I had started the saxophone and, and uh, wasn't really interested in jazz when I was younger. But then um, right before I got in my freshman year of high school, I went to this um, this jazz summer camp, uh, of which there are many. But uh, there were fewer back then in the 90s. And uh, I went to this camp in Door County, Wisconsin called Birch Creek Summer Music Camp. And um, it just was being around a bunch of other people my age who were just crazy about this music. And I, um, I was so curious, you know, I had never really liked listening to it before, but I just saw all these other people and all these faculty that were just, they lived and breathed jazz music. And, and so I took it upon myself to just, I, I bought a, I remember I bought the a Charlie Parker album and I just put it on repeat and forced myself to listen to it over and over until I, I could sing along and um, before I knew it, I was just hooked on it. You know, I, I went from from Bird, I went to Cannonball, and, and from there, um, yeah, I, I, I just uh, fell, I just kind of fell in love with it. And it happened to me at a pretty early age. So that the time, by the time I was 13, I was pretty much dead set on being a professional saxophone player. Um, I think that's, I think that was the age anyway. And I, yeah, I was really fortunate to, to make that decision very early on. What was the first live jazz show you ever saw that blew you away? Oh, man. I think it was the um, first live jazz show I saw that really, really took my breath away was the McCoy Tyner um, at the Pabst Theater in Milwaukee. And um, it was supposed to be McCoy Tyner with Michael Brecker. He was, he, they were uh, promoting that album, Infinity, that had come out around that time. And uh, I think it was a Grammy winner and all that. But, yeah, I saw McCoy, and I had just been digesting Coltrane's music up to that point. And um, I'm listening to McCoy sort of in um, uh, incidentally, you know, because he was with Train on all those albums. And uh, just to see him in person just blew my mind. I could not believe that I was seeing the actual person that made these sounds and all these recordings that I was obsessed with. And it just, I, it, I couldn't wrap my head around it. 
Um, it, Brecker turned turned out not to be there. I think he was sick, but they got Bobby Hutcherson instead, who was just incredible too. I didn't really know about Bobby's music then, but um, yeah, that that definitely would have been the show that that um, that was the first important one for me. So speaking of live shows, what was the first show, first stage, I should say, that you played on where you thought, "Wow, I can't believe this is happening." Oh. <laughs> Man, that's a good uh that's a good question. I, I want to say uh the first stage probably it was probably the brand new Dizzy's Club uh Coca-Cola up in up in New York City. I was there um at Juilliard doing my masters or my my post bachelor's work. And um yeah, I just uh you know, I had played on I had played on historic stages here in Chicago. But I really wasn't leading a band at that time. I was still relatively young. So the time that I, I got on stage leading my own band at Dizzy's Club, um, even though it was a relatively new club, it had just opened, but there was a lot of talk about it, and there was sort of a lot of prestige involved with it. And I think that was, um, yeah, I was just, uh, <laughs> I was overcome with uh, with happiness just to be sort of, I felt like I was being accepted into the into the club in a certain kind of sense. So you've been at this game for a while, and there's a lot of facets that go into being a professional musician, from you know, recording an album, promoting it, playing live shows, everything, the myriad that goes into it. But what is it that you like the best? What, what, what drives you the most of, of the process of being a professional musician? Yeah, I think it goes back to that idea of you know, camaraderie uh, with the musicians on stage. I just I live for that moment on stage where you know, we're thinking the same thing simultaneously and those little magical moments that we, we strive for in every performance. You know, I've, I've been so fortunate to play with these musicians here in Chicago who are, uh, who are world-class, as I said, and um, they just make the conversational aspect so fun and the mind reading is, uh, it happens all the time. And uh, that is definitely my favorite part of, um, of being, uh, you know, a professional saxophone player is just waiting for those magical moments on stage that that happen when you're when you're uh, when, when I've been uh, lucky enough to share the stage with with musicians like that, like these guys on on this album. So, very simply, put, why do you love jazz? I don't know why I love jazz. <laughs> I think I love jazz because it's uh, it's very um, what's the word? I part of it is I, I can't put my finger on it, but then what, you know when I think about it more, I think it's the humanity of, of the music. It's not only is it intellectually stimulating, but it's also very um, open to mistakes, and you know you can really find yourself as a person while you play the music. So it's the kind of music that really allows you to um, be very introspective. Uh, and figure out things about yourself while you play it. And I, I, I can't think of another style of music, um, not to be snooty or anything, but I can't think of another style of music that I've played that, that allows allows you that degree of, of really humanity. So everyone out there has a perception of you, your family, your friends, your fans, but ultimately you're the one living your life. What's your perception of you? Who do you think you are? I think I am a person that is just very passionate about the music, uh, about jazz specifically, and uh, I hope that people um, see that, and I hope that that shines through. Uh, I, I think it is. I think people are aware of how deeply, you know, emotionally connected I feel to the music. Um, and the only other thing that I feel that passionately about is my family, honestly, Um but uh yeah, it's just I, I hope that they I hope that they see me as a very a dedicated, passionate um musician. That's that that would be I would think a, a success. So Trio Book is the new album. Tell everybody when and where they can get it, any live shows, anything pertaining to your world, where can they go and figure all that out? Sure. Well there's two big dates. Uh, as you mentioned before, May twelfth is the release date. You'll be able to find it on all streaming platforms and, and on Bandcamp as well as through my website, of course, chrismadson.net. But uh, we have a release show two days before May 10th at Epiphany uh, Performing Arts Center in Chicago on Ashland Avenue. And uh, details about that um, 
can be found on all my social media. You can uh, find me on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, my handle is Chris Madsen Music, and uh, all the details will be available there. Excellent, Chris. Hey, thank you very much for taking time out today to talk about the new album, your life and music. It's been wonderful. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank you, Joe. I really appreciate the time. Thanks for listening and tuning in to another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Chicago, Kansas City, and spots all over the world, giving fans all that jazz. Thanks to Chris for his time, energy, and cool. If you want to hear more Neon Jazz interviews, you can find us on Spotify and Apple Podcasts. Subscribe to us at YouTube. For everything Neon Jazz, go to the neonjazz.blogspot.com. Until next time, enjoy the jazz, my friends. Neon Jazz.